Hello, this video is going to be about conservation of energy, which is really the most important topic in this entire unit. So let's review some important stuff. Energy can be defined as the ability to do work, and doing work on an object involves applying a force and changing its velocity. The work done on an object is equal to its change of kinetic energy, and energy can therefore be defined as the ability to cause another object to speed up or slow down. The information from the last slide, all those sentences, is really encapsulated in this one equation, which is known as the work energy theorem. It says that the work that you do on an object is equal to its final kinetic energy minus its initial kinetic energy, and final minus initial, that is the change of kinetic energy. So the work that you do on an object is equal to the change of that object's kinetic energy. These words only exist to act as a summary for this real mathematical relationship. We also learned that anything capable of doing work has some sort of energy to use. Gravity specifically can apply a force to falling objects and must therefore contain some sort of energy. The maximum amount of work that gravity can do in an object is called that object's gravitational potential energy. And you got the formula because it was MGH. GPE stands for gravitational potential energy. It's the maximum amount of work that gravity can do. MG is the force of gravity because it is the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of gravity near the Earth's surface. Normally we use 10 or 9.8 for this. And H is the height of an object. So the work that gravity can do is equal to the force that gravity can apply multiplied by the distance over which gravity can act. Simple, right? That's where this gravitational potential energy formula comes from. Now we're on to the new stuff, the conservation of energy. We know the formula for two different kinds of energy, kinetic and gravitational, right now, which is the energy of motion and the energy of your position in a gravitational field, whether you're high or low. The most important fact about energy is that it is conserved. And what this means is that the total amount of energy in a system never changes over time. A system is just a set of things that you care about. If we pretend like only kinetic energy and gravitational energy exist, then we can summarize this conservation law with the following equation. The kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to some constant unchanging number. And remember, these two things, kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, these are not really concepts in and of themselves. They're just shortcut words for their respective equations. So you can think of this as a variable, Ke. It really stands for 1 half mv squared. Same for GPE. Now, this constant unchanging number is called the total energy of a system, and it tells you all the possible states this system could be in. So the total energy is equal to the gravitational energy plus the kinetic energy, if we ignore the other types. As a minor vocabulary note, um, what we're doing right here is we are ignoring all the microscopic energy of an object, which is like its heat, uh, its chemical energy, etc. So technically, this right here is the total mechanical energy. That's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. But I'm just going to call it total energy because it's easier that way. So technically, when I say kinetic energy plus potential energy is total energy, I mean total mechanical energy, ignoring things like heat, friction dissipation. Not a big deal for now, though. So let me give you a concrete example. Let's say that you have a one kilogram apple and the planet Earth. This is your system. The Earth and the apple are interacting through gravity, specifically. That's the system, everybody who's interacting. If I don't tell you the total energy of the system, it could be doing anything at all. The apple could be arbitrarily high off the ground and moving at any speed. If I just say I have an apple, that's one kilogram, and I don't tell you the energy of the system, then it could be, you know, four million miles above the Earth and moving at two miles per hour. Or it could be, you know, really close and moving at six billion miles per hour. I mean, if I don't tell you the energy, then the kinetic and gravitational potential energy could be anything you want. They're unrelated. But if I do tell you the total energy of the system, your possibilities are now limited. So for example, let's say that the system has 100 joules of energy, right? The total energy is 100 joules. In this case, there are only a few ways that this apple could look, because there's only a few different ways that this 100 joules could be distributed among gravitational and kinetic energy. For example, maybe the energy is split half and half. You have 50 joules of kinetic energy and 50 joules of gravitational energy. In this case, you can figure out the speed and the height of the apple because the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. So if you know this number and you know the mass, you can figure out the velocity with an algebra. And the gravitational potential energy 
you can figure out the height from that, as long as you know the mass, which we do. So you plug in the numbers, where g is the acceleration of gravity. You might use 9.8, I'm using 10. And all of a sudden, now you know the speed and height of the apple, if this energy is split 50-50. So when the energy is half and half, it's moving at a speed of 10 meters per second, and it is 5 meters above ground. But this isn't the only way that this energy can be distributed. The 100 joules could be split 50-50, but it doesn't have to be. So for example, let's say that we have this 100 joules split up so that 75 joules of it is kinetic and 25 of it is gravitational. That's allowed. 75 plus 25 is 100. In this case, we have a different state of our system. Things are set up a little bit differently. You would be able to find out the speed and height the same way by taking the kinetic energy, setting it equal to 75, the gravitational energy, setting it equal to 25, and just plugging through the numbers to figure out that in this case, you have a speed of 12.25 meters per second and a height of 2.5 meters. So the total energy can be split across the kinetic and gravitational energies in several different ways, but even though this can be split up many different ways, it cannot be split up infinitely. This is kind of what I mean. Imagine you have a graph of an apple's height and speed, right? This is how high it is off the ground, this is how fast it's going. If I don't tell you the total energy, you could have any height and any speed. For example, you know, you could be low height, moving slowly, or low height moving quickly. Or you could be really high off the ground and going fast. Or uh, you could be very high off the ground but moving slowly, right? There's no relationship between speed and height if I don't know the total energy. But if I do know the total energy, if I know what this number actually is, then all of a sudden there is a relationship between the kinetic and gravitational energies. And this relationship can be expressed in a couple different ways, but basically it just restricts the different ways that things can be. You can think of this sort of like a, the equation of a line in this weird abstract graph of height versus speed if you want. That's not the best way to think of it, but this equation structures the relationship between speed and height. All of a sudden, when you know the total energy, now there's only one possible speed for every height. So if you are very, very high up off the ground, maximum height, you have no speed. If you're going at the fastest possible rate, you're not high up the ground. And for every single height, you could figure out the one single associated with speed. So one more example with this apple. Let's look at specifically what happens with the energy when an apple falls 8 meters down from a tree. This situation, let's look at what's happening to the energy. We know that the kinetic plus the gravitational energy is equal to the total energy if we ignore all the other energy types, which we are right now. Before the apple falls, it has zero kinetic energy, because when it's on the tree, it's not moving. So the kinetic energy is zero before it falls. And we can figure out the total energy then with the gravitational energy, which is determined by the equation gravitational potential energy equals mass times acceleration of gravity times height. So we'll plug that in. We get the mass of the apple, which is one kilogram. The acceleration of gravity, I'm estimating it to be 10 in this case, and the height off the ground, which is eight in this imaginary example. Plug in the numbers, and you can calculate that the total energy is going to be 80 joules. And now you know the total energy of this Apple-Earth system. The Apple interacting with the Earth has 80 joules of energy in this case. This is helpful. Not right now. This doesn't seem like it told me anything useful. But it's helpful because the total energy doesn't change over time. So if I know the total energy at one time, I can use that knowledge to figure out the total energy at another time and maybe get some more useful information. So when the apple falls down throughout the entire trip, the total energy stays at exactly 80 joules. It doesn't change. Now as the apple falls, the gravitational potential energy goes down because the height of the apple decreases. The height goes down, so the GPE goes down. But this doesn't actually cause the total energy to change because the apple speeds up when it falls too and gains kinetic energy. So the Ke goes up. So at the process, at the very top, all of this energy is gravitational because it is not moving. Then it falls a little bit. It's going to fall, and as it decreases in height, so the h will go down, it will increase in speed, so the velocity will go up. The decrease in height will cause the gravitational energy to go down, but the kinetic energy will go up because of the increase in speed. And the amount by which that happens will exactly counteract each other. And what I say is I say, notice I have 80 total joules of energy. When it falls down, it's lower off the ground, so less height, less gravitational energy, but it's going faster, so more kinetic energy. 
these two things combined will still give you the same number. They'll still give you 80. As it falls, you can see the same thing. Every loss of gravitational energy is exactly countered by a gain of kinetic energy. So the total energy remains 80 joules the entire time. So at height equals zero, all the energy is kinetic. Now in the real world, the reason why it doesn't go forever is not because energy is destroyed, it's because the energy that it has, the kinetic energy, gets converted into a new type of energy that I haven't talked about, which is vibrational energy in the earth and the air, like sounds and shock waves. So the 80 joules of kinetic energy gets transformed into another form. But you're not normally asked about this. We are pretty much going to ask you about what happens to the apple until it almost hits the ground. And so you don't have to deal with any of this weird stuff. You only have to deal with kinetic and gravitational energy. But know that it doesn't disappear in the real world. It just turns into heat, shock waves, other less obvious forms. In general, we use energy to solve problems involving change over time. We figure out the total energy at one point and use that to predict things in the future. I'm going to do two problems to make sure we get how to use energy to do calculations, and that'll be done. I'll do the first one in detail. Let's say that you have a half kilogram ball thrown up from the ground with an initial velocity of 7 meters per second. What is the maximum height the ball reaches? Now this is possible to do with kinematic equations, but I want to show you how to do it with energy. We're going to find the total energy using the information the problem gives us about the initial conditions of the system, which is when the ball is just, just leaving your hand. So this is the initial state of the system, what it's like at the very beginning. And we're going to use that to predict the height at a different time. So later on, we're going to figure out how this initial state basically evolves. And we're going to use this to figure out stuff at the top. So we know that the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy is the total energy. Always. This is always true. Let's use the initial kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy to get the total energy, because these might change over time, but this never does. So if we can use this problem, the setup, to figure out the initial kinetic energy and gravitational energy, we can get the total energy which we can use to solve things at a later time when the velocity changes and the height changes. So let's do that. Now remember, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, gravitational potential energy is mgh, these two things are basically just variables that stand for their little mini equations. We know what goes in here. We'll just plug in the numbers. It's thrown off on the ground, so the initial height is zero. That's the only tricky thing. But everything else is pretty easy. That's the mass. That's the velocity. G is 10, or 9.8, whatever you're using for the acceleration of gravity. So you plug in the numbers, and you can chug through that. Figure out the total energy is 12.25 joules. And that means that at every single point in time, the kinetic energy plus the gravitational energy is 12.25 joules. Always and forever. Not just at the beginning, always. Because the total energy never changes over time. Now, as the ball moves up in the air, its height increases. It moves up. But it also slows down. Therefore, the kinetic energy goes down because it slows down. And the gravitational potential energy goes up because it ends up going higher in the air. So that goes down, that goes up. But in this process, these changes cancel each other out. So the total energy remains the same. The total energy is equal throughout all points of the trip. Now we want to know the maximum height. And at the maximum height, all of the ball's energy is gravitational. None of it is kinetic. So basically, we're going to set all this energy and make it all gravitational. Set kinetic energy to zero. That will tell us the maximum height. So at the top, all the energy is gravitational, none is kinetic. So Ke is zero. GPE is still our formula, mgh. We will pretty much always use this. And you can plug in the numbers. We know the mass of the ball, the acceleration of gravity. And we can do some very simple algebra to figure out the height. The ball goes up 2.45 meters. That is the maximum height the ball reached. That was the first problem. I'll do the second one more quickly. You have a 2,000 kilogram car driving up a 50 meter hill at 20 meters per second. Now when the car reaches the top, the brakes stop working and it rolls down the hill. It can't stop. So assuming there's no friction, how fast will the car be going at the bottom? This one is harder. You might not be able to do this with the kinematic equations. Imagine you have the hill. There we go. At the very top of the hill. The ball has some height, or sorry, this car, it has some height, right? It's 50 meters above the ground. But it doesn't only have height. That's not the only source of energy. It also has some motion. It's moving at 20 meters per second. 
So this is different because in my initial conditions, I have gravitational energy, but also kinetic energy. And I gotta take both of those into account. So the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy added together gives you the total energy. We're gonna plug in information from the state of the system at time one on the top of the hill. So when the car is up here, this is the initial state that we're gonna calculate with when the car is up there. And then we're gonna use that information to figure out what the system is like later when the car is at the bottom. So this is going to be point 0.1, this is going to be point 0.2 in time. So let's plug in the information from when the car is on the top of the hill, because that's what the problem tells us. 1 half mv squared plus mgh is the total energy, that's what this really means. So I plug in those numbers, and I get that the total energy is 1,400,000 joules. That's a lot. But it's a heavy car, it's going pretty fast, pretty high up the air. 1,400,000 joules is the total energy of the system. And that means that at every single point, the kinetic energy plus the gravitational energy are 1,400,000 joules. Now we can use this information to predict what happens at time two when the car is at the bottom of the hill. These numbers tell us what the car is doing at time one, right? When it's on top of the hill going this fast. We use this to figure out the total energy and then we use that to sort of project into the future. So once again, we have our formula. Kinetic energy is just 1 half mv squared. This is just mgh. We can start to plug in some numbers. Now at the bottom, the height is zero. That's really important. At the bottom of the hill, the height is zero because the car is now on the ground. With that, we can plug in everything else. This is zero, but the mass of the car is up here. The velocity of the car, well, that's what we want to find out. That's going to be a variable. Uh, g, the strength of gravity, is going to be 10 meters per second squared. So you plug in all the numbers, you do your calculations, and it turns out, once you do this all, the velocity is 37.42 meters per second. So this is how fast the car will be going at the bottom of the hill when the brakes are cut. You figure that out by using this formula twice. You used it once at the beginning, when you didn't know the total energy, to figure out the total energy, right? And then, used it once at the end when you need the total energy, but you didn't know one part of this stuff on the left. Um, I hope that was not too difficult. I hope this was helpful. <laughs>